Unseen World of the Bible, Session 11, Supernatural Intent, the 18th of December, 2022. Objectives for this session include these. We learners will be able to identify the rock that Jesus builds his church upon. To explain why Jesus was transfigured. Then describe Yahweh's supernatural intent and to choose to go public as a Jesus follower. You can download the Session 11 outline and PowerPoint slides from galencurra.online. The session themes include these. The Great Reversal was underway. Satan would no longer have any claim over humanity once people belonged to Jesus. And no act of kindness will fail to be used by the Spirit to direct someone's heart. No articulation of the gospel will prove fruitless. Yahweh has a threefold plan for humanity. First, to redeem human beings from sin and death. Secondly, to disempower the serpent and his minions. And thirdly, to restore Eden throughout the earth. In order to do so, he himself had to become a human being because all humans had failed him. Thus, he was to die and rise back to life as a clean sacrifice for human sins then to reign righteously over nations without sin, injustice, or failure, and to dwell intimately in the midst of redeemed humanity forever. He had to do this in order for human beings to become his children. Those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead, will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. Being immortal, they have no need to marry or to reproduce, since they will never die. God had to become human in order for human beings to become divine. His divine power has given to us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Yahweh had to entice dark powers to crucify Jesus. The angelic rulers of this age are coming to nothing. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Even so, dark powers would willingly crucify the Messiah. As scripture says, Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Jesus quoted this psalm when he was on the cross. Thus it describes his crucifixion. Bashan, being a high mountain range with snow and ice, has no cattle herds upon it. The bulls here represent idols erected on that mountainside in honor of spirits and pagan gods. Thus it was the pagan gods who were present at the crucifixion of Jesus, jeering and leering at him. When Jesus was ready to go public, Yahweh announced that Jesus is the Messiah. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn and open and the Spirit descending upon him as a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, 
With you I am well pleased. Another gospel reads, This is my beloved Son. Thus the spirits who were listening were not mistaken that this Jesus, he is the Messiah who is to come into the world and reclaim the nations. Thus immediately the tempter tried to suborn the Messiah. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread, as Yahweh had done for the Israelites in the wilderness. Then the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, said he, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus indeed was to reclaim all the nations of the world and their splendor. Satan wanted him to do so while subjecting Jesus to his own rule as he had done Adam. We may suggest several points regarding the significance of the temptation of Jesus by Satan. Jesus resisted wherein Adam had succumbed. Jesus thus remained obedient to God, proving stronger than the devil. Jesus kept God's plan secret from Satan, evading a shortcut to win the nations because he determined to redeem the nations by dying for them, and so he is able to succor or help those of us who are being tempted. Again, to show he was the Messiah, Jesus immediately began doing the works of the Messiah. He went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness amongst the people. News about him spread all over Syria. Not only was Judah at this time a district of the province of Syria, but Syria included the Bashan mountain range, Mount Hermon. Continuing to do the works of Messiah, people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds came from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions across the Jordan followed him. This definitely caught the attention both of the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem and of the spiritual powers that rule over nations. Furthermore, Jesus fulfilled the messianic profile of an exorcist. Although there are few examples of casting out of demons in the entire First Testament, when Jesus came public, he began doing so immediately. Psalm 151 reads, I went out to meet the Philistine, and he cursed me by his idols. But I drew his own sword. I beheaded him and took away disgrace from the people of Israel. This psalm was preserved in the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament and has also been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thus it was an expectation of first century Jews that the Messiah should behave as did the ancient King David, who was able to destroy those who oppress the people of God, by the gods of their idols. David would later write, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Interestingly, the arrow that flies by night in the Greek Septuagint is translated the daytime demon. All of these terms, the terror, the demon, the pestilence, the plague, were names of demon spirits in the surrounding nations, and the Hebrews knew them well. At the same time, Jesus launched his international mission. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim 
the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Thus the twelve, symbolically representing the twelve tribes of Israel, are now announcing that the kingdom has shifted. It is now under the rulership of Messiah Jesus. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Some Bible versions say 70 instead of 72. Different versions of the First Testament manuscripts list the nations that went out from Babel as being either 70 or 72. Thus, some New Testament manuscripts read 70, and others read 72. They're both correct. But now that the demons had to submit to Jesus' followers, this again was a challenge to the devil and to the dark powers that they must submit to him. Jesus replied to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Another challenge to the dark spirit world. On this map, we see the mountain range called Bashan, in which is located Mount Hermon. Just south of Bashan is the city of Caesarea Philippi that the Tetrarch Philip had founded in honor of the Roman Emperor Caesar. At Caesarea Philippi to this day, you can visit the Grotto of Pan in a great cave going deep under the great rock of Mount Hermon, called at that time the Gates of Hell, or the Portal of Hades. To this day, there are the remains of many shrines to the false god Baal and other deities, again popularly known as the Gates of Hell, or Hades. To further challenge the dark powers to react against him, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? When Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, he was alluding to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, in which the future coming Messiah, arriving on clouds of glory, was given this title, Son of Man. And so by asking who is the Son of Man, any listening spirits would know that he is asking who is the Messiah. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still other Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Elijah, we know, had never died, and just as he was taken up into heaven, perhaps he would come again on the heavens. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Well, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. All the listening spirits of Mount Bashan were listening. They heard this confession of faith. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Whilst acknowledging the truth of Peter's confession, calling him Petros, a little stone, Jesus then says, Upon this rock, upon this mountaintop itself, infested with demon spirits, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. None of the spirits ruling over the nations will be able to overcome my community. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That is, the ruling spirits who dwell in the heavens, holding authority and keys over the nations, are soon to lose their power. As human beings who have faith in Messiah Jesus receive that authority, 
and whatever Jesus gave to Peter in chapter 16 of Matthew, he will give to all of his apostles in chapter 18 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus then gave a sneak preview of his messianic glory. He said to them, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. That kingdom came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus is hereby saying to the listening spirits, This kingdom will come in the lifetime of these men, so you better hurry and do what you intend to do. So after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them, up on a high mountain, Mount Hermon, in the Bashan Range, taking his position in the midst of the demon spirits who dwelt on that mountain. Thus Yahweh again identifies Jesus as his own son. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Elijah, the great prophet who had never died. Moses, the giver of the law and the leader of the people Israel. Peter said to Jesus, Ah, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The term shelter is the word tent or tabernacle. Just as Moses had set up a tabernacle, a great tent in the wilderness, in which Yahweh's glory had come to reside, so now he is proposing to do the same not realizing that Jesus must first die and rise. Perhaps these three men wanted to sell tickets. In all events, Yahweh now ordered all men and spirits to obey Jesus. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. The Greek term here translated listen is often translated obey. Listen to him and do as he says. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. It was no longer to be humans who might provoke the civil authorities or the Romans to crucify Jesus. This would be provoked by the evil spirits themselves. Now Yahweh wants you and me to lead a new kind of life. Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. The kingdom has come in power, folks, and is currently reigning from heaven, waiting for him to return. And since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let's live under the power and the glory of the kingdom of Christ. For remember, if we endure, if we keep the faith until he comes, then we will also reign with him over the nations. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, Jesus has promised. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. Amen and Amen.